adventure. So there's only one way to figure it all out. Unzip the archaeology. Make it naked. Rabbis, stars of David, bagels, and the synagogue. The Pope, the cross, candy cane, the church. Today, we think of Judaism and Christianity as distinct and powerful world religions. But 2,000 years ago, they were minorities in the Roman world. And the Romans were hell-bent on wiping them off the face of the earth. History tells us that Jewish rebels fought the Romans to the bitter end. And the early Christian historians would have us believe that followers of Jesus refused to fight Rome. They turned the other cheek and they fled to Pella in Jordan. But is that the whole story? Isn't it possible that Jesus' followers fought the Romans tooth and nail, shoulder to shoulder, with their Jewish brethren? Rome crucified Jesus for being a rebel. Just another Jew making trouble. The more Rome clamped down on the troublemakers, the harder the Jews fought back. Thousands of crucifixions, and 40 years later, Rome wanted to finish it once and for all. In 70 AD, they entered Jerusalem and destroyed the Jewish temple. It took survivors as slaves, and with the gold they stole from the temple, they built the torture theater we all know as the Colosseum. They thought it was over. It wasn't. A group of Jewish rebels called the Sicarii were stationed at a place called Masada, a palace fortress they had taken from Roman soldiers several years before. Masada became the last stand of the rebels who refused to surrender to the Romans. What then took place has made this site a symbol of resistance for people around the world. What can archaeology tell us about the Masada rebels? And is it possible that there were Jesus followers among the fighters? This is Masada, the legendary Masada. 2,000 years ago, Jerusalem had already been burnt. The whole country had been subdued. There was only a handful of rebels, and they were up on top of that rock, and they were still fighting. Some say the Jews started this war. Some say the Romans did. Before I go up there, I need to go back to where all this began, Jerusalem, to uncover the critical events that led to this rebellion. I met up with Professor Isaiah Gaffney, first century historian, to talk about the conditions of those times. The Romans sent to this province governors that were ill-equipped to rule in a very, very challenging part of the world. Governors, by definition, just came to rip off peoples. And that's uh, exactly. It. A Roman rule was not only corrupt, it was bankrupt. The central bank was in Jerusalem, in the Holy Temple. Monies collected from Jews around the world were kept here. Where Jews prayed and the ground was considered so sacred, non-Jews could be sentenced to death if they entered the inner courts. And yet, in 66 AD, a Roman governor planted his pagan sandals on God's domain. Now you gotta understand what that means. It means a pagan was entering the holy ground, the physical presence of God on earth, and he was essentially desecrating it. But that wasn't enough. He grabbed 17 talents, 17 talents, a lot of money in those days. And the Jews had enough. Enough of the crucifixions, enough of the beheadings, enough of the stealing of the money, enough of the taxation, enough of the oppression, and they said, it's revolution time. No ordinary revolution. It required a messiah to lead them. According to Jewish faith, a messiah was a political figure sent by God to lead the faithful to freedom. The Sicarii were front row and waiting. This group of Sicarii developed a uh, religious ideology that claimed you cannot be subservient to Rome. 
These, now, these Sicarii, they were, they, they were dagger men. Well, yeah, well, what happens is ultimately they wind up in places like Jerusalem with daggers hidden, and they're, they're terrorists of sort. They, they're there to, to sow uh, terror and fear. This is a group that has Galilean roots. The Galileans the were Galilean. troublemakers. Yes. As far as the Romans were concerned. As far as the Romans were concerned, yes. And in fact, when these Galileans show up in Jerusalem, they encounter local segments of zealots that are also against the Romans. The Sicarii were from the Galilee. So was Jesus, and so were most of his followers. The Sicarii were considered by the Romans zealots, troublemakers, political opponents. So was Jesus, and so were his followers. The Sicarii believed they were living the end of days, messianic times. So was Jesus and so were his followers. Now, the Sicarii and the Jesus movement may have differed about tactics, but they would have appreciated each other's anti-Roman stance and religious zealotry. In 66, the Sicarii go down to Masada, where they break into the armory. They take arms, come to Jerusalem, try to take over the mini-rebellion that already had begun in Jerusalem, were unsuccessful, they were pu pushed out. They go back to Masada and they bide their time there from 67 until 73, until the war catches up with them. So is it possible, is it just possible, that some of the followers of Jesus ended up seeking refuge with the Sicarii at Masada? I'm gonna go and check it out. The rebels were on top. All around here was the greatest Roman legion of all time, the 10th legion. If you were a Roman and you tried to make your way up the snake path, you'd end up dead. So what the Romans had to do is build siege engines. They had to build a giant ramp. They had to surround the whole place. Today, archaeology confirms the broad outlines of the story. But as they say, God is in the details. What does archaeology have to tell us about the details? This is not the way I would go up to Masada with a cable car. I would go up the snake path. That's the way to do it. But I'm here with Guy Stiebel, uh, uh, who is the co-director of the uh, Masada uh, expedition. And he likes to take the cable car. So It's uh, nice to blame someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blame me, blame me. <laughs> Guy Stiebel explains that the story of the Sicarii, the rebels who took refuge here at Masada, comes to us from only one source, first century historian Flavius Josephus. If it hadn't been for Josephus' writings, this place would have been a rock in the distance with no story, and archaeologists couldn't have understood what they found here. As it is, archaeologists have uncovered evidence for how the Sicarii lived here as good Jews. They had ritual baths, and they ate kosher, and they prayed in their synagogue. It's this was used as a real synagogue. People yeah. prayed here. Mm -hmm. After the praying, they sat down, they had a little bit of schnapps, maybe vodka, just, just like today, right? It's, 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 it was a living community that lived here. You can see where they live. I know where the baker used to live. I have um, a receipt that was given by the baker. He's saying, I'm giving uh, one challah every Shabbat. So this is actually giving part of your bread to the priest uh, every week. So it's uh, actually the most ancient evidence for, for this practice. And these rooms were converted into living quarters by, by the refugees themselves, by the rebels. So what he did here was just plastering the wall. So the rebel, the baker, came in here. He was assigned this little room mm -hmm. as his personal yeah. tiny Spartan condominium, mm -hmm. if you will. Yes. He came in here. It was supposed to be a wall, but he turned it into a room. And as he plastered, he used his hands to plaster mm -hmm. it. And you literally have the finger marks. Yeah. I mean, that's archaeology doesn't get better than this. Eh? No, it can't. Okay. When I'm here, yes. when I'm in this simple living quarter, mm -hmm of the baker. Yeah. I put my hands on his okay. hands, literally. Mm -hmm. um, I, I feel tremendous sympathy, so tremendous connection 
these people weren't just sitting around saying, who couldn't we kill next? No, this is, this is site friendly. As Guy say. shows me around, I become aware that this isn't just the headquarters of militant assassins. Really, that's great. This is a community of refugees running for their lives from the Romans. There was probably a mix of anti-Roman types here. I started to think of Jesus and his followers. There was Simon, who was a zealot. Zealot was a term applied to those who acted with God's zeal, fighting Roman paganism and Jewish collaborators. So they called Simon, Simon Zelotes. There was also Judas Iscariot. Could it be that he was a Sicari? You, you know that um, there is a theory that Judas Iscariot mm -hmm. actually, just like you have Simon Zelotes, mm -hmm that those two guys, at the very least, one yes. was a zealot, one was a Sicari. Yeah. You refer to his name in English, but if you refer to, to the Greek or to the Latin or actually to the Hebrew version, his name was Yehuda Ishkreot, the man who came from Kreot. So there's nothing to do with the Sicari. Kariot means place. Why would you call Judas the man from place? The fact is, Romans corrupted people's names all the time. For example, they called Plato a falcon. Some scholars confirm that Iscariot is a Roman jumble for Sicari. If Judas Iscariot, Judas the Sicari, followed Jesus until his death, then it's quite possible that some Sicari praying in the synagogue here at Masada were followers of Jesus. Is it possible that there were the people we would call today early Christians at Masada? Uh, we have no proof whatsoever. Um, however, when I'm saying that we know about other sects, uh, other Jewish sects at Masada, it's based on facts. I have scripts that are typical to them, so we have hard evidence. So if you're asking me as an archeologist or as an historian, no, we don't have evidence for early Christianity. But I can say, you show me evidence that they weren't here. Needless to say, I'm not convinced. So what are the facts? Well, he tells me, here in the synagogue, archaeologists found scrolls buried in the ground, holy writings on goatskins. And inside uh, one of the scrolls uh, was um, the uh, resurrection of the dry bones. Ezekiel cried. Ezekiel cried. Ezekiel cried. The resurrection of the dry bones is a portion of the biblical book of Ezekiel. The scroll has been attributed to a Jewish sect called Essenes. Just like Christian monks today, Essenes took vows of celibacy and lived together in communities. Like the Sicarii of the time, they awaited the Messiah and believed that they were living the last days prior to the final judgment. The scroll reflects the Essene belief that on the day of judgment, God would raise the dead for a new life. Some scholars suggest that this scroll may have been buried by the rebels at Masada as a last act before their death. According to Josephus, the Masada rebels didn't die by Roman sword. They committed suicide en masse. The fact is that the 10th legion of the Roman Empire, the mightiest force, the Delta Force of ancient times, came here, surrounded the place, and couldn't break it for months or years on end. And the fact is that at the end, one way or another, the defenders, some thousand people, chose death rather than slavery. There is archeological evidence around Masada for a long and brutal siege, the Roman camp. The spur on which the soldiers built a ramp to crest the wall. But what archaeology on Masada confirms the story of suicide? These are the last words which, according to the historian Josephus, were uttered by the commander of the people who defended Masada. He told them, come, while our hands are free and can hold a sword, let them do a noble service. Let us die, not as slaves. And let's leave this world as free men in the company 
of our wives and children. I went with Guy to the Northern Tower. He talked about what archaeologists found that supports the broad outlines of the sad story of suicide. They came eye to eye with what they describe as the last minute of Masada when they found the skeletons, the bones of uh, a man, a woman, and a child. Uh, that seems to fit the Josephus story. He says that the defenders of Masada voted, that each one went to his own family, embraced them, killed them, then then they killed each other, the men, and then the last guy fell on a sword. Mm -hmm. Here you excavate, there's a skeleton of a man, a skeleton of a woman, a skeleton of a child. So, so do you think it really happened that they committed suicide? It, it's very tempting to, to take the narration of Josephus, I mean, his account, and, and, and say, okay, this is what we have here. It is very tempting. Can we take Josephus so literally? I mean, if all the rebels at Masada committed suicide, how could Josephus know about the story? I talked with first century historian and Josephus expert, Professor Steve Mason, about the very convenient way the story gets to Josephus. Josephus claims that an older woman, and as well as a younger woman with five children, so seven altogether, hid in a cavern or cistern. There were big water cisterns, caves dug into the top of the plateau, and so escaped while everyone else was busy killing themselves. The defenders of Masada had water, giant cisterns. This is just one of them. Come, look. They hid and escaped. And then when the Romans arrived on the scene and called out anybody there, uh, they responded, yes, we're here, and they were, they were taken into protection. And Josephus debriefed them. Well, that's the question. Where does the story come from? You, they think it might be just a literary device? Yeah. So, if the literary source is in question, then what archaeological evidence do we have that the Masada rebels committed suicide? the most profound archaeological proof that Josephus' story is true are the lots, 11 pieces of pottery with names on them, used by the rebels to pick the men who would do the deed. The men killed their women and children, and then by lot, 10 men were chosen to kill the other men. The last 10 then chose lots to determine the one who would kill them and then himself. Written on the lots are names like Son of the Donut. Was that the baker? And one was Ben Yair. The Sikari leader was named Eliezer Ben Yair. But where are the bones? 1,000 people died here, and Guy has told me of only three skeletons found. There should be more human remains. You have to bear in mind that the Romans stayed here for several more months on top and several more years down in the west. So, so they it, would have burned the bodies? Yes, it is just common sense. I mean, they would stay here with 1,000 corpses. Why doing that? So Romans would have burnt all the evidence of the suicide. And yet, in 1963, 25 skeletons were found in a cave archaeologists call 2001. An official reports say that a scroll was found in this cave. Does this scroll place Jesus followers on Masada? <laughs> Unofficial reports say that a scroll was found in cave 2001 that could connect Jesus followers to Masada. I met with Professor James Tabor, archeologist and historian, about the contents of the cave. Well, this is a mystery. You're saying a cave was found, bones in there, artifacts in there. Nobody's talking about that. Well, there is a journalist from Australia. His name is Donovan Joyce. And he does claim that he went to Masada and saw a scroll that had come from this cave written by a Nazarene. Hold on. Jesus was from Nazareth. Can this be proof that Jesus' followers were at Masada after all? But the scroll got sort of smuggled out or... So Masada still has its secrets, It eh? does. One thing that does check out in a really odd way, the scroll he saw that's now disappeared, he said it had a date on it, Era Pesach, 
which in Hebrew, as you know, is the evening of Passover. So I looked at Josephus, and he says that Masada fell on the 14th day of the third Greek month. I have a computer calendar. I typed in the 14th, 73 AD, comes out Passover evening. <laughs> uh, you talk about the Last Supper. If there were Nazarenes at Masada, picture this emotion. Their leader ate a Passover meal and died the next morning. They're eating a Passover meal and dying the next morning. That's, that's kind of chilling. I went back to Jerusalem to find out from Gaia about evidence of a Last Supper. Is it possible that in that cave, in Cave 21, they were sitting down to a Passover meal? 2001. 2001, they no, were sitting no, down to a Passover no, meal? No, we Did know. you find lamb, for example? Yes, but uh, nothing Among to do. Among the defenders? Yeah, yeah But definitely. could that be the remains of a Passover meal? No, no. There's nothing what? to do. How can you say this is, these yeah. are the remains of the meal? It's, they lived there for seven years, seven or eight years. They were eating goats and they were eating No, lamb. I'm just saying it's possible yes. that some of the early Jesus followers were also up there. Everything is possible. I can't, as an archaeologist or as an historian, if I don't have any kind of evidence, I can say everything. Yes. You need hard archaeological evidence. Yes. Not dissuaded by the lack of Paschal lamb, I decided to track down one last expert, Bill Klassen, early Christian historian. I think that there were some Christians up there. Uh, how many? And of course, we have no proof of that. But it seems to me to be a very probable situation. Why? Well, uh, let, well let me, let's take a, a Jewish family in Jerusalem. And you have two members of that family have become Christians. They follow Jesus as the Messiah. They, they're still Jews, of course. The others, uh, two of them have uh, joined the Zealot group, and they're here to fight against Rome. And the others are kind of lukewarm, but they're saying it's getting hot here, and the only way to survive is to leave. So why don't we go to Masada? And it's quite likely, on my judgment, that the Christians in that family would have said, we're going with you. We're staying together. The fact is that we have archaeological proof that there was a mixture of people on Masada. But they all believed in messianic times. And maybe some of these guys were Jesus followers. If a Jesus follower was sitting in the synagogue next to the baker, how could we know 2,000 years later? What was the difference at that time between a Jew and a Jesus follower? Well, one was waiting for the Messiah to come, and the other was waiting for the Messiah to come back. Whatever their difference, they stood as one force against Rome.